Gluten is the new dietary enemy. More and more people are swearing off wheat and grains in pursuit of better health. There's a lot of information on the internet, lots of books, lots of media out there saying how a gluten-free diet can make you healthy. What we've really seen in the last few years is the rise of celebrity endorsements of the gluten-free diet. Some experts say humans didn't evolve to digest gluten. For the 2.5 million years of evolution, 99.9% .9 of our species have been gluten-free. There are claims the gluten-free diet cures a wide range of conditions like depression, arthritis, even autism. But this has some dietitians concerned. People are going on gluten-free diets to lose weight or to increase their health, when in actual fact they're doing the opposite. In this special investigation, I cut through the hype of the gluten-free diet. Should we all get on board, or is it just another fad? This is Australia's wheat belt, the food bowl of our nation and the heartland of a multi-billion dollar industry. Craig Neal has been milling grains in Gunnedah for decades. He says it's now the most widely grown crop in the Western world. Wheat is one of the staple foods that uh, is incorporated into so many of the um, varieties of foods that we eat today. It's also the main source of gluten in our diet. Bread, pasta, cereal and pastries. These products of wheat make up 20% of the calories we eat. My whole life I've been involved in the grain industry and I've seen a dramatic transition in the eating style and eating habits of a consumer over that period. Around 10% of Aussies are now steering clear of gluten. Cafes and restaurants have moved swiftly to cater for the new clientele. And it's here at Melbourne's Gluten-Free Expo that you get a real sense of just how popular the gluten-free diet has become. This is our ninth year at the Gluten-Free Expo. We supply gluten-free pizza bases throughout Australia. Today we bought a range of our gluten-free breads, our buckwheat and shear, our quinoa and soya breads, all baked fresh. So we've got a range of nine beers there. So instead of using wheat and barley, we use sorghum. We've grown year on year, every year, 20-30%. So with all the hype around gluten, what actually is it? This is pure gluten. It doesn't have much flavour and in fact it has very little nutritional value. But you add water and its unique properties come to light. Gluten is a protein made up of two molecules, glutenin and gliadin, which form an elastic bond in the presence of water. Now, gluten is what makes dough sticky and flexible. And while it's found naturally in wheat and other grains, bakers often add extra gluten to bread to give it that spongy texture. Essentially, gluten is a very important protein for food texture and taste. It traps carbon dioxide, so it makes bread fluffy. It allows pizza dough to be twirled around. It gives it that kind of elasticity. It just so happens, though, that parts of gluten may be toxic to the immune system in people with celiac disease. Gastroenterologist Dr Jason Tai Din says even the tiniest amount of gluten can be toxic to someone with celiac disease. It triggers an abnormal immune response that leads to damage to a variety of organs. This includes the bowel, this also includes the skin, the joints, the bones, the nervous system, the liver. It's a very systemic condition. About one in 70 Australians, like Kirsty, have celiac disease. My first symptoms of celiac disease probably began about five years ago. I had a lot of symptoms like bloating, the diarrhoea, 
joint pain, fatigue, dermatitis, but I didn't actually realise it wasn't normal until my doctor, four years later, sent me for a blood test to check for celiac disease, which came back positive. <laughs> Kirsty is now meticulous about removing gluten from her diet. I find at home it's easy because I have all my safe food. It's more expensive, but I don't have to stress. I find eating out at restaurants and cafes or at family or friends' houses is quite difficult because I have to worry about not only did they use gluten-free flour, but did they use a separate chopping board? Did they use a separate toaster? Did they wash the utensils? Did they use a separate deep fryer? That can be really stressful. It can make a hard eating out. Kirsty says that people who needlessly request gluten-free meals in restaurants might diminish the seriousness of celiac disease. People may order a gluten-free lunch, they may order a gluten-free salad, and then they order the normal cake or they order a beer with it. And so other restaurant staff think we can do that too. And they don't understand that we can't have any gluten at all. Even just one or two crumbs will obviously leave me sick with all my symptoms. Gluten unleashes its damaging effects in the small intestine. So these are actually sections of the small intestine under the microscope. On the left here, you can see a normal, healthy, small bowel. And what you can appreciate are these long finger-like projections, which we call villi. Now, the villi are really important in increasing the surface area of the bowel and allowing nutrients to be absorbed properly. On the right here is a slide from somebody with celiac disease. And what happens is that you get a lot of immune cells causing inflammation to the area. And this expands the tissue up and effectively obliterates the villi. So this lack of surface area obviously results in some kind of malabsorption of nutrients? Yeah, exactly. So this can lead to iron and other vitamin deficiencies. Is this damage reversible? Yes, it is. So if a person's diagnosed and treated with a gluten-free diet, this villus atrophy or the damage here can completely return to normal. So is it just people with celiac disease who should be avoiding gluten? One of the world's leaders in the field of gluten research is Italian-born professor Alessio Fasano. He's a paediatric gastroenterologist at Massachusetts General Hospital in the US. We, as a species, we are not engineered to eat wheat because for the 2.5 million years of evolution, 99.9% .9 of our species have been gluten-free. Gluten came into the picture only 10,000 years ago with the advent of agriculture. As a result, the human gut reacts to gluten as if it's a foreign invader and mounts an immune response against it. We didn't know the details of why gluten is toxic until the recent past, when scientists worldwide start to really look at this undigestible fragment of gluten. And to our major surprise, gluten is perceived by our immune system as a component of a bacterium or a virus and unleash the same weaponry that we use when we're under attack by an infection. As gluten enters the small intestine, it's recognized as foreign and an immune reaction causes local inflammation in the gut. This occurs because humans haven't evolved with the right machinery to digest it properly. Gluten cannot be completely dismantled because we don't have the scissors, i.e. the enzymes, to cut in pieces and then peel off the single amino acids. So if humans can't digest gluten properly, does that mean we should all give it up? Not so fast, says Professor Fasano. The vast majority of people can deal with that and clean this problem without any clinical consequences. But in some people, gluten may actually play a role in the development of autoimmune diseases like arthritis, lupus and Hashimoto's disease. In 2000, Professor Fasano's team made a remarkable discovery. His lab showed that gluten could stimulate a molecule in the gut called zonulin. Zonulin is a protein that has the capability to modulate the permeability of the gut. Regardless of whether or not someone has celiac disease, when they ingest wheat, the gliadin portion of gluten stimulates the release of zonulin, which in turn opens the junctions between cells in the gut lining. This theoretically makes the intestine leaky. 
the intestine has the important task to create a barrier to be extremely discriminatory who comes in and who stays out. The leaky gut syndrome or the leaky gut situation is a situation in which you lost this capability of control. This is purported to allow macromolecules to leak from the bowel and increase inflammation and the risk of autoimmune diseases. This is a controversial area of science because the evidence is scant. While some predict this discovery will earn Fasano a Nobel Prize, others in the medical fraternity remain skeptical. It's compounded by the lack of an accurate clinical test to assess gut leakiness. Still today, classical immunologists will have a hard time to accept the concept that zoning by modifying antigen trafficking can have such a role in a variety of immune diseases that span again from cancer to autoimmune diseases. So the burning question at the moment is why do so many people who don't have celiac disease boast the benefits of a gluten-free diet? Is it real or is it imagined? In the past, we, and I put myself in there, made the rule that if you have a problem with gluten, that must be celiac disease. And if celiac disease was ruled out, you had no business whatsoever to be gluten-free. Over the years, particularly in the past four or five years, we learned that actually that's not the case. There are many people, they feel miserable when they eat gluten-containing food without being celiac. It's now being referred to as non-celiac gluten sensitivity. So non-celiac gluten sensitivity is the term used to describe people who believe that gluten makes them unwell, makes them sick, but that they've had celiac disease appropriately excluded. While it's still controversial, Dr Tai Din says it's gaining acceptance among medical researchers. This is an area where personal experience and anecdote really trumps the medical evidence that's emerged. And when people feel better going gluten-free, it's a very compelling argument that it's actually helping them. Many people, when they go gluten-free, report that their tummy upset has settled down, they have better energy levels, mouth ulcers disappear, their aches and pains have gone, and often that they've lost some weight. Sometimes parents of children with autism will find that the gluten-free diet may help their behaviour, or patients who have other autoimmune diseases might find it helps with their joints. But when you look at actual controlled studies, of which there have been very few, that kind of benefit hasn't been borne out. So I don't want to say that there's no benefit. We just haven't yet been able to conduct the studies to show that with good scientific proof that it's happening. Dr. Tai Din says research into other components of wheat may provide the answers. What we see here is the, the structure of a wheat kernel. And you can see the major protein is obviously gluten, and this is responsible for celiac disease and some cases of wheat allergy. But what's striking is that there's a whole range of other proteins as well as carbohydrates. So, for instance, albumins and globulins have been causes of wheat allergy and these amylase trypsin inhibitors are now being implicated in causing inflammation in the intestine and might be potentially a basis for some wheat sensitivity in some people. And certainly studies are underway. So it's quite likely that someone who thinks they're gluten intolerant might not be, they're actually intolerant to other things in wheat. Exactly right. So what we're seeing is that there's not just gluten, there's all of these other proteins and also the carbohydrate components, particularly the fructans. And when people go wheat free, it's very possible that much of the gluten sensitivity problem is related to these other non-gluten components. The fructans are part of a group of carbohydrates called FODMAPs. Professor Peter Gibson from Monash University is the world leader in FODMAP research. FODMAPs is an acronym which stands for fermentable oligo, dye and monosaccharides and polyols. And what it does is describes a group of largely sugars which are poorly absorbed from our small intestine or they're totally undigestible. In the gut, FODMAPs draw water into the bowel and ferment on bacteria, causing gas. The wall of the bowel tends to stretch more, and that's an important stimulus for the nervous system in the gut. So that if you've got a sensitive bowel, you've got irritable bowel syndrome, then this will cause sensations of bloating, 
pain and you'll get secondary changes in how the bowels work. You might get diarrhoea, you might get constipation, you might get an alternating type bowel pattern. Normally, FODMAPs are beneficial for gut bacteria, but not for people who are sensitive to them. FODMAPs are not only found in wheat staples like bread, rye, pasta and grains, they're also found at high levels in garlic, onions and artichokes and fruit like apples, mangoes and watermelon. But the good thing is we find foods which are low in FODMAPs which you can replace. So instead of having apples and pears, you can have strawberries or kiwi fruit. And then there are the legumes. Most people understand when you talk about legumes, they understand the effects of a tin of baked beans on the bowel. Many of the foods that you've mentioned that contain FODMAPs are eliminated in the paleo diet. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's why many people find they improve their well-being on the paleo diet? Whenever you modify your carbohydrate intake, particularly, you're likely to producing FODMAPs. So I think you're correct in that the, that some of the improvement that people experience with the paleo diet uh, will be due to that. The problem with the paleo diet is that you're also restricting a whole lot of other things which are unnecessary and they're not sustainable. Joshua has had tummy upsets as well as behavioural issues since he was a child. My parents have been really supportive. They started taking me to paediatricians since I was two, trying to find out why I had some of the issues that I did. I'm glad you came by. Oh, thank you. See you again soon. I had quite severe ADHD and I had headaches and other issues like that. Joshua's doctor suspected it could be something dietary related. Not knowing whether he was intolerant to gluten or FODMAPs, Joshua was put on a gluten-free diet. His gut problems and his ADHD symptoms improved dramatically. Joshua assumed that he had celiac disease, but never had a definitive diagnosis. When I was 18 and went off to university, I decided to go off my diet and eat whatever, and I got really sick, just feeling so bad, really bloated, really sluggish, just feeling really unwell. And then I went back onto my diet really strictly, and so I went totally off of gluten, and I thought, oh, I'm feeling heaps better. Maybe I'm celiac. Maybe I should talk to my GP about this. Testing for celiac disease while you're still on a gluten-free diet is problematic. Dr Tai Din says it often gives false negative results. One of the biggest problems I see in my clinic are patients coming in who've already started a gluten-free diet, who feel better, but then realise they should be tested for celiac disease because they appreciate that it has important medical implications. And then I'll have to tell them, well, look, we can't actually test you with the blood test because it won't become positive even if you do have celiac disease because you're gluten-free. One way to confirm a diagnosis of celiac disease is to have a genetic test. So Joshua decided that he should find out once and for all. He gets the results in a week. An emerging theory that might explain the rapid rise of gluten intolerance nowadays is the way in which bread is baked, the process of panification. The process of panification in the past was an overnight process in which you take the flour, you put the water, you put yeast in there, and then for 16, 18 hours, you have this dough growing. This overnight process would allow enzymes from the yeast to effectively break down the gluten, a process we're not capable of doing ourselves because we humans lack those enzymes. But bread making techniques have changed. What used to be an overnight process now only takes about two hours. Now, during these two hours, what you have is the enzyme we're not able to completely dismantle the toxic element of gluten, and therefore, even if we eat the same kind of wheat, we have an increased amount of toxic component gluten that we ingest because of the fact that it's not been dismantled during the panification. Wheat farmer Craig has another theory. He believes the rise of gluten intolerance has more to do with the modern techniques of processing wheat. He says the current methods of milling wheat may contribute to gut problems. 
it's a very highly refined process. The endosperm and the starch are milled down and all the other ingredients within the grain are extracted and then they're added back in at whatever ratio or proportion the end product requires. This modern processing produces high volumes at lower cost and is commonly used for the mass production of the sliced white bread that you find in supermarkets. That's why Craig now processes more of his wheat through a stone mill instead of a roller mill. The whole grain goes into the stone mill and it is ground into flour in one process and the flour comes out the other side. It is a very simple process and there is no destruction to nutrition or deterioration of the grain through that process. Craig says the demand for this type of wheat is increasing. While it still contains gluten, he says there's no harsh chemical processing and he thinks people might mistakenly blame gluten for their gut problems when it's likely to be their sensitivity to the chemicals used to process the wheat. We don't bleach it, we don't extract any of the bran or the wheat germ. There is absolutely no chemicals added to any of the products that we process and that just gives us the comfort of supplying the end user a foodstuff that is 100% nutritional to the highest level. This type of less refined flour may be used by artisan bakers for making sourdough, which is popular with health conscious consumers. Now that more and more Australians are cutting gluten from their diet, our supermarket shelves are increasingly being stocked with gluten-free products. This is the typical range of products available to those looking for gluten substitutes. It's so good for my clients with celiac disease because they've got so much more variety than they used to have when I started practising. But even those people without celiac disease often think gluten-free is healthier. Well, it's funny, you know, they're all here in the health food aisle, but they're not necessarily healthier. And in fact, what you find that if you grab something like the pancake mix, if we compare the standard pancake mix here per 100 gram, we're looking at about 840 kilojoules. So this one's close to 1,400 kilojoules. So. Was it double? Yeah, so often when they remove the gluten, they have to add in additional fat and sugar to make mm. it more palatable. Yeah, so gluten-free, not always healthier? Definitely not. Dietitian Melanie McGrice says people without celiac disease who insist on going gluten-free put their health at risk. Research shows that people who follow a gluten-free diet are at higher risk of nutritional deficiencies, particularly fibre and B vitamins, but also magnesium, calcium and iron. There's also research to show that it can have an impact on the microbiome as well. So I think that there is a lot of confusion that the gluten-free diet is healthier when in fact it's not. But Fasano says it all depends on how you go gluten-free. If you intent to go naturally gluten-free. So you don't use any substitutes, so you eat only fresh fruit, fresh vegetable, meat, fish, nuts. What you do is to embrace the diet that our species evolved with, and you're gonna lose weight, and you're gonna feel great. But if you are talking about a gluten-free diet in which you indulge, with gluten-free pasta and cookies and cakes and bread and beer, you will come back to my clinic, as many people with see the disease they do, complaining that they gained 20 pounds since I saw them the previous time. Why? Because you substitute gluten with fat and sugar. People really need to work at making sure they get an adequate balance of vitamins and nutrients and fiber in their diet. And at the end of the day, a gluten-free cake is still a cake. The my key message would be that if you don't need a gluten-free diet, you don't need to bother. But instead, focus on having a whole food, less processed diet, and you'll still get the same health benefits. Joshua is returning to the doctor with his wife, Carmen, to receive his gene test results. Look, the last time we chatted, we talked about the fact that going on a gluten-free diet seemed to at least partly help some of your symptoms. So we've gone ahead and done the gene test, and I have the result with us today. Um, how are you feeling about things? 
I've been nervous. Are you? Yeah. yeah. Well, I've actually got some really good news for you. Your gene test has come back as showing you don't have the genes that give susceptibility to celiac disease. <laughs> so, a great result. Oh, wow. Yeah. So this tells us that your susceptibility for celiac disease is very low and that the likelihood of the condition is less than 1%. That yeah. is awesome. Yeah, really good <laughs> result. So Being cleared for celiac disease means that Joshua doesn't have to be as meticulous about his diet. He will still reduce his FODMAPs, but doesn't have to worry about a strict gluten-free diet like someone with celiac disease. Low FODMAP diet is very different to a gluten-free diet. Gluten-free diet means you've got to be a detective and you've got to find out where gluten is in everything that you eat and uh, everything you cook. You can't cook chips in the fat which had the fish batter in it because there might be gluten in it. Low FODMAP diet is just reducing the total amount of FODMAPs that you eat. So they're much easier to do because it gives you a lot bigger choice and you don't have to be a walking detective. It was fantastic to speak to Josh and particularly with these really good results. Well, now we can say at least that the gluten that he believes was triggering his symptoms is not due to celiac disease. I guess sometimes there's always that fear in the back of your mind that if it is celiacs, there are serious medical consequences of having that. And just really relieved that I don't have those and I don't have to be on a strict, strict diet. Probably can afford to be a little bit more lax with some of the dietary restrictions and not be too concerned if there's a little bit of pollution here and there. Yeah, it's really exciting. It's really good. I'm really happy. To learn more about gluten or the FODMAP diet, you can visit our website. Next week on Catalyst, lead. We revisit our story on lead exposure in childhood and its effects on behaviour and learning. Although much is being done to reduce exposure, once the damage has been done, it can't be reversed. Yeah.